Adam Lerner, and welcome to this week's Tech Talk number two. Uh, nice to be back online. I'm still kind of nursing a little bit of a flu bug. Something's going around there, guys. Um, I got it, and wow, man, I, I really had it good. But it hasn't stopped me from constantly thinking about photography. Nothing would. I can't imagine, ever. Um, so... Lots to talk about this week. Big, big week for Canon. Hello, Canon users. How about that 5D Mark III? My gosh. So many incredible upgrades and enhancements to that camera that is such a staple for so many photographers. I mean, geez, if I was a Canon shooter, yeah, I would at least have two 5D Mark IIs in my arsenal. And now... I would definitely have a couple of 5D Mark III's. Um, that new focusing system, wow. Cannot wait to see that really put to use. And put to use, I don't mean like looking at spec sheets or reading you know, certain uh, reviewers out there that just go ad nauseum about different ISO, 100% cropping BS garbage like that. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I want to see stuff that is done by real photographers. I want to look at the EXIF information for a photographer or photographer's work that I really enjoy to look at and see, okay, you know what? They're using this camera. This is what they're getting with it. That's great. Am I going to worry about softness around corners? Am I going to worry about, you know, how many megapixels, how big a print can you? No. This is going to be a recurring theme. Um, I think it's very easy to get all hung up on specs. And you know, look, if we compare like the 5D Mark III to the D800, they're comparable. If we compare the the D, the the uh you know, what I don't even know what the top of the line Canon is, the uh the the 1X uh versus the 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 Nikon D4, very comparable. Price points about the same, <clears throat> size and shapes about the same. Um no, they do they do really literally, you know, quite possibly the same kind of stuff. And like I've said this before, and I'll say it again, you know, I'm a Nikon shooter. I started as a Nikon shooter. Some of you guys are saying like, why are you a Nikon shooter? Well, let me tell you why. Here, we'll, we'll share a little story. We'll have story time right now for a moment. Back in college, uh, I remember, you know, we were all shooting and we were shooting film and I had a manual camera and I was shooting with my Pentax ME Super. Uh, great camera. I got some great results. I had a 51 too. That was kind of my mainstay. I had a 28 2.8 that I bought at a pawn shop in California that was really good for going wide. It was nice and a clean copy. And I also had a 100 2.8 as well for doing telephoto. Um, I had a flash. I had a winding unit. Never used the winding unit. I don't even know if I ever used a flash on that thing. But I ran hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rolls of film through that thing. And I learned a lot. And I still actually use that camera today. Um, now, a lot of my friends had Nikons. A lot of the professional shooters that I really respected and admired at the time had Nikon cameras. And for me, there was always that psychological thing that, you know, someday I'm going to get a Nikon. So when uh, the time came and I decided to go digital, I bought Nikon. And I've stayed with that platform since. And to be quite honest with you, I'm really, really happy that I did. Um, now, if tomorrow somebody said, you know what, look, you have to go shoot Canon, or the client specifically said, we're only going to accept files that are shot on Canon, <clears throat> or if, <clears throat> excuse me, if Canon just called up and said, hey, Adam, <clears throat> we're going to give you all Canon gear, but you got to dump all that Nikon stuff. You know what? I would do it. Honestly, I'm gear brand agnostic when it comes to gear. Okay. I have my opinions. I think we all have opinions. I think all photographers are opinionated to a degree. And I think that it's good to be opinionated and have opinions to a point, of course. Uh, but um, anyway, I have 100% respect and adoration for the Canon brand and what it brings and what people can do with it. Now, just sitting here looking at this Canon site, um, I find it a little off-putting. It looks like a really kind of corporate kind of catch-all site. And if you look in here, look at all the stuff these guys make. 
Cameras, camcorders, printers, scanners, copiers, calculators, projectors, security systems, binoculars. What? Office equipment. Hardware, software. I mean, all this stuff here. Printing production stuff. These guys are in to so much stuff. From projectors to printers to copiers to f fax machine. I don't even know. Um, I think just on a surface level, you know, I like that Nikon is an optical company. That's all they do. Optics. They make cameras, they make lenses, they make binoculars and microscopes and stuff like that. That's essentially it. Yeah, I know they've made a few scanners and things along the way, whatever. But their, their, their impact, their R&D is going toward optics primarily. Now, look, I'm not knocking Canon. Again, these guys are a great company. Uh, I know that A1 is like, you know, every photographer probably cut their teeth on that camera. Um, anyway, so, you know, the reason why we're at the Canon site today, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is because I'm not necessarily so excited about the 5D Mark III, even though I think it's going to be a spectacular, spectacular camera. Um, I am really, really what I am jazzed about is the new speed light, that 600 EXRT. <clears throat> now I've got mixed feelings about this. This speed light here, okay, let's look at this right now. $629. Hello? $629 for a speed light. Are you kidding? Uh, I don't think that they're kidding. Uh, I think that they had their best intentions. And I think that they're trying to accomplish a lot. And, you know, I, I, I have yet to really look at all the reviews and see it put to test in the field. But I think that there's some really interesting advancements that are being made with this new Speedlight series. One of which is the fact that it's got built-in radio. Okay. It's got radio communication. What does that mean? Well like your pocket wizard, like your radio popper, it communicates via radio. That means that you don't have line of sight issues. And what do you mean line of sight? Well, with a conventional speed light, typically when you were communicating, you're communicating via infrared. Infrared is a very directional signal and it's also limited in its range. So in other words, if the two infrared, you know, dinghies weren't pointing at each other, there was some kind of an obstruction, you were going through a wall or maybe a piece of glass, whatever, you could have been screwed. All right. Well, radio travels at, in this case, 2.4 gigahertz. That's the same frequency as your cordless phone. I'm sure a lot of you guys are on like 5.8 or 6 gigahertz phone, whatever. But it's the same kind of radio technology. You've got really superior range and you've got, you know, less interference from common obstructions. So that is fantastic because now rather than having to have a pocket wizard and your speed light, it's all built into one gizmo. Yay. All right. Now, the one thing that I found to be really super aggravating in addition to this, even though I'm really kind of jazzed about it, is they came out with the speed light transmitter. I forget what the price, the recommended price on this thing is. I don't know. It's probably a few hundred bucks. This thing is going to be able to, con you know, communicate with all of your, your different speed lights. Um, you know, it's got the built-in radio, um, it supports, you know, ETTL, it kind of does all the stuff, you know, you can do high speed, speed sync, I mean, all this awesome, awesome stuff. But the hot shoe mount, the, the, the version of this little gizmo, this ST-ET3RT, does not have a hot shoe mount. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if you're shooting, and you've got this gizmo on the top of your camera, and you've got a bunch of speed lights all over the place, you cannot, on top of this unit, mount another speed light. So what does that mean? You're probably going to have to use a, a, a cable, an adapter, or I don't even know. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just means that I don't know what they were thinking. Um, I feel, considering you know the, the price point of this system, why not be able to have something on top of the camera. I know that a lot of event photographers, they might have remote speed lights set up that they're triggering either via Nikon CLS or Pocket Wizard or whatever. 
now with this new Canon system, and oftentimes they want a, a speed light on top of their camera. Like the Pocket Wizard, the Flex TT5, you've got that little speed light, you know, I mean, you've got the hot shoe adapter in there, so you can not only control all of your speed lights, you can also, you know, um, put a speed light on top of your camera. Not the case, okay? Now, you know, you've got this ETTL here, the whole thing, you've got everything that you guys could possibly need. Excuse me. But uh, they didn't put in a hot shoe adapter. Um, I find that to be, you know, just one of those kind of things that's a little bit, uh, a little bit aggravating here. Um, curious to see these things really put into use and to see what people are going to think of them. But, you know, for $630 per speed light, <clears throat> that's a huge, <clears throat> excuse me, huge investment. And let's also think about another thing. Canon claims that they are backward compatible with the other speed lights in their group. Um, not really. You can optically trigger other speed lights with your 600 EXRT, but if you're going to go into a different triggering mode, you can't use either or, as far as what I can tell from what I read. Now, let me just put a quick disclaimer on this whole tech talk thing, all right? This is an, a, a tech talk thing based on, you know, my views and the information that I've gathered on certain things. I might ha not have the full story here. I'm certainly open to correction without it being ad nauseum, okay? Because this is really more of a discussion, more of a food for thought, okay? I'm just, I'm just responding to kind of the early information that's coming out on these things. So I just want to say that I am no, by no means an expert on this gear. And by no means am I trying to, you know, cut Canon apart for doing this. I think that this is an amazing step. And to be honest with you, I don't know why radios haven't been in these things previously. I don't even know why Nikon came out with the 910, you know, without putting the radio in it. I think it's a great improvement. But um, who knows, maybe that's going to be the wave of the future. Maybe all speed lights going forward will be uh, radio, who knows? I think it's a much better system and uh, I, I I'm really excited to see how this grows. Now, I would imagine that perhaps these are compatible with uh, pocket wizards, but again, we will revisit that at another point. So uh, let's just say goodbye to the Canon stuff for the time being. And let's get into some other kind of stuff right here. Okay, now, um, there's been a lot of Pentax cameras that have been announced on the market recently. A lot of stuff in wacky colors and all kinds of different things that are out there. And, you know, I think that these like kind of weird, like I saw this candy apple red limited edition can, uh, Pentax 645 so it's it's Pentax's medium format. You know, let me just let me just see if I can bring that up really quick. Um, we'll just open up a new tab here, and we'll do. We'll just type in Pentax USA and see what we got here. Okay, um, and let's just see if I can bring that up. You know, let's just talk about this stuff for a little bit over here. You know, so Pentax is you know, they 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 announced that they were bringing medium format into the realm, you know, of digital. Everybody was excited. The medium format camera was going to be kind of on par with um, a DSLR. It was going to handle like one, you know, and they put all this kind of garbage into this camera. And man, I don't know. I think they really, they really missed the mark. What does this say here? Um, all right, let's just keep kind of trying to find this out here. So let me just type in I don't even know why I can't just easily get to stuff that I want. Sometimes it just drives me crazy. Um, products. All right, so we'll go right to medium format. And look at this thing. Okay, they got the 645. Let's just talk about this thing really quickly first, okay? 40 megapixels, weather sealed, digital level function, 14-bit PEF, Adobe DNG, ISO 100 to 1600. All this kind of stuff in there. It's got in-camera HDR image capture. Um, 
11 point autofocus, dual SD, you know, captures to SD cards. I don't think any pros are using SD cards in their in their full frame cameras. It's kind of a weird thing. Um, you know, it's got this, uh, it's got the digital back built on. Now, you know, look, this is kind of a dangerous thing. This is the same kind of thing that uh, Leica has run into. And that Leica, if you look at the S2, which, you know, doesn't even compare. I mean, my God, I lust after that Leica S2. It is just quite possibly one of the most beautiful cameras you will ever pick up and handle and shoot with. In fact, let's just, we'll just go into that one second while I'm uh, ranting over here for a minute. Um, the similarity, the only similarity <laughs> between the, uh, the Leica and the Pentax medium format is the fact that it is a non-modular system in that you basically are, okay, again, you know, these, these websites are just like, they're crap. Where can you just click on and go, boom, I'm going, I want to go to where I want to go. We're home and photography. I mean, is that really where we want to go? Okay, I guess that's it. All right, so we're going to the Leica S system. And it is just, look at this stunning thing. Look at these lenses. I mean, the thing is just, as they say, a class of its own. There is nothing wrong about that statement. In fact, that's 100% true. Um, I handled this camera last year at, uh, at the uh, Photo Plus in uh, Dumbo, um, the Photo Expo, and I shot with it a little bit. And it is just spectacular. Um, if you put the optional grip, I think the grip's about $1,300 just for the grip. You put that grip on it with the 70 millimeter 2.8 and the camera is about the same size as a D3S Nikon, Nikon D3S um, with a 24 to 70. Uh, very, very positive feel. It's so clean and just so beautifully made. Um, look at that. Look at just the minimal controls. Now, interestingly, the, the S system is not quite... Uh, I wouldn't, it's not quite full frame medium format, if you want to call it that. It's slightly, it's kind of a, a slightly smaller negative. It's its own thing, which, you know, it's fine. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a pretty beautiful camera. You know, you don't have the same kind of issues with this camera, like with anti-aliasing, um, like you do with, let's say, a Leaf or a Mamiya system. Um, but let's now, let's look at this Pentax, okay? This thing, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, comparatively, it is just, it is, it's ugly. It is seriously ugly. Let me see if I can find some more. Look at that thing. Wah. I mean, wah. And seriously, guys, there, no offense to any of you guys that own this thing, okay? You know, this, is look, again, they're just my opinions. Um, one thing that, that's kind of nice is that they did put a, a, a tripod mount on the bottom of the camera because oftentimes, you know, if you are shooting and you're shooting landscape and you want to shoot portrait, you know, and you tilt your tripod, you know, to the side, you actually lower everything and you have to compensate for it. This way you just boom, boom, done. So you're kind of shooting at the exact same height. And uh, that's kind of a smart thing. I mean, it seems like they thought of so much stuff with this camera. I mean, there's even a little hot shoe mount. How cute. Um, I don't like the fact that you're locked into a 40 megapixel uh, digital back or digital sensor in the fact that it's not a modular system and that you really can't do anything about that sensor. I think, you know, look, if you can afford this camera, I think it's about 10,000 bucks for the camera with an 82.8. Um, not a bad price, you know, considering what you're getting, but I honestly feel based on all the research that I'm still doing and doing, um, it's definitely not for me. I think I would, I would much more, I would be much more inclined to go with the Leica, but you know, you're talking about 28 grand for the body and then seven, five, seven grand for each lens. And you know, it's just in, in such a different league that uh, at this particular point, you know, it's just priced way too far out of my budget. But, you know, let me just digress for a minute. Okay. Let's just go back for a minute here and look at this thing here, 645D limited edition. They made this thing in like this weird red glossy color. I mean, I really have to file this under what were they thinking? I mean, seriously, it, it is just, it's freakish looking. Um, now, 
On another note, there is the uh, Fuji X100 in black. Limited edition. I think they made 10,000 of these things. And it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I wish I had a black one. I think that the one that I have is beautiful, but the all black one is just absolutely stunning. Um, is it worth the extra few hundred dollars for the all black one? To me, no, because I'm just going to shoot my, with mine and, you know, let it get all kind of scuffed up and banged up and kind of, you know, whatever. I think for the collectors, yeah, it could be worth it. Um, you know, but, um, you know, back to all this kind of stuff here, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about two really, really different things uh, with medium format. And uh, I just think that, you know, Pentax just has such a limited range of lenses. I'm really not really sure about their commitment to medium format. I think that they've got their hands in so many other things that I'm a little bit, I would be wary to get behind the Pentax. Um, I think that if I was a hobbyist um, or maybe a landscape or wildlife shooter um, and I had the money, yeah. Maybe rather than another DSLR, the uh, 645 would be kind of a cool option. But I think that this thing is going to be obsolete because they took so long to come to market with it that at this particular point, I think that they should have potentially or will probably um, have a more robust sensor available for that camera. Um, okay, so you know what? Let, let, let's, let's move on for a little bit here. I'm going to kind of wrap this week's segment up with this next little bit here because I think I've gone on a little bit further than I imagined with my first rant. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk to you guys about file management. Now, a lot of you guys are shooting raw. And if you're not, turn off your computer right now. No, just kidding. Um, most of us are shooting raw. And, you know, look, if we're shooting, you know, hundreds or thousands of images, we are filling up our hard drives. I think that there's, that there's nothing wrong with going through your sets. And if you have the time and you have the, the know-how, go through and remove images that you know you're never going to edit. You know are donkeys. And what I mean by donkeys are those images that the focus is off, exposure's off, whatever it is, that they're just, they're completely, they're just not keepers. Um, if you've got, you know, thousands or hundreds of different sets, that could be a really tedious process. So I would definitely suggest going forward in the future, if you can, when you're importing and you get that list of, you know, all of those images from your card, you can selectively go through, uncheck the ones that you're fairly confident uh, you don't want, and then you can format your card and whatever, and then you're not importing all this extra stuff into there. If you're not really willing to spend the time on that, and or you're just too darn busy with all this kind of stuff, then you need to have a backup strategy. And Regardless of what you're doing here, you need a backup strategy. And what does that mean? Well, it means that you need to basically keep your files organized on your computer in such a way so that you know where they are. You want to keep a folder hierarchy and a strategy as far as accessing those files and building on those catalogs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you also need a backup strategy. And I can't tell you how often it the case comes when I hear from friends of mine and they're calling me and they're saying, oh man, my hard drive crashed and I might have lost all my work. You need to have a hard a backup strategy. Um, you can start with something as simple as an external hard drive, something like a USB external hard drive. Um, you know, Jared and I, we both use Drobos and a Drobo is basically an external RAID system where you have a bunch of hard drives that are all kind of striped together as one giant container. And it's a redundant system. It's a self-healing system. And the neat thing about that is that, you know, you've got all these hard drives in an array that are kind of working as one entity. If one of those drives gets bad, it'll kind of heal itself. And then you can plug another drive in and it'll kind of expand its container back to fit that sense, that, that, that size. A little abstract for you to maybe kind of grasp if you're not a computer person, but... The nice thing about Drobos is that you don't really have to be computer savvy. But let's just say you've got, you know, a two terabyte hard drive in your computer. You want to have, you know, at least a four or six 
terabyte backup strategy because as that backup continues to grow, it's going to continue writing a bigger and a bigger and a bigger file to that external drive and you're ultimately going to fill it up. So the old the 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 saying goes backup often and backup a lot and don't think to yourself, "Oh, you know, what day of the month is it? You know, I really should backup." Honestly, backup at least once a week, if not every day. I back up every day, you know. Granted, I've got client work. I really can't afford to have any data get lost. But uh, you'll be doing yourselves a lot of good by having redundancy with your files. The other thing that a lot of folks do is they have an offsite backup. So what that means is they have a hard drive that they back up their key files, their core files, the ones they know that they can't lose, and they make yet another copy and they bring that to a safe location, whether it's maybe your parents' house, maybe you put it in your bank vault, I don't even know. So backing up is really, really important and I can't stress that enough. So I think we've kind of gone over a lot of stuff today. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your guys' feedback. So please leave any questions and comments that you have below and we'll see you soon.